Just imagine within three months of a coup and ejecting France, Niger is going to become the fourth fastest growing economy in the world by 2024, according to World Economic Outlook projections. And Niger will be the fastest growing economy in Africa. Some of you may ask, where is Ibrahim Traore on this? Well, Burkina Faso will be the ninth fastest growing economy in the world by 2024 and the sixth fastest growing economy in Africa. There are other countries in Africa that are making good progress like Libya despite being in war mode. But I just wanted to focus on Niger and Burkina Faso because of the obvious reasons. You know when Niger increased the price of uranium from 0.8 euros per kilogram to 200 euros per kilogram. Immediately after the junta ejected France, critics laughed at them. Now see who is laughing. Imagine French companies were selling Niger's uranium at $200 per kilogram and giving $11 to Niger. But 200 euros versus 0.80 euros? I wasn't prepared for that. Anyway, I want to say congratulations Niger, Africa is rising and this is our moment. Listen to this video. Even our thieves are not patriotic. <laughs> when they steal from Africa, they invest in Europe. They don't believe. The minister said, fix our own government, get a governance system. The people in charge of governance systems steal and invest elsewhere as an indictment or an affirmation of their own incompetence and incapacity. But the second bit is that I think both uh, His Excellency Musafaki, uh, Professor Lumumba, uh, and the minister indicated when you grow a disconnect between the people who give you legitimacy, who are the ultimate resource for the transformation of any nation, when you grow a disconnect between your culture, Amilcar Cabral said, every revolution is first a cultural revolution. There were 200 coups in Africa between 1965 and 2012. In the 1960s, there was at least one coup every 60 days. In the 1970s, barely 18 years after Ghana's independence, at least 85% of African states had some coup experience or the other. And West Africa accounted for almost 44% 44 of those. Uh, I mean the coups between 1958 and 2008. There was a temporary reprieve in the period post-1990. Some academics have suggested this because Africa had become more democratic. I want to disabuse you of that notion because it's lazy intellectualism. What had changed was that Western interest in a unipolar world in changing regimes had dissipated. The West no longer needed to use force. There was no competitor, either ideological or otherwise. What had essentially happened, there was dominance of one set of interests. So as we reflect on unconstitutional change of government, it's not just mere tinkering at the local level, but it's also what explains the ouster of Nkrumah, the assassination of Lumumba, the assassination of Sankara, the assassination of Amilcar Cabral, the assassination of Samora Machel, the ouster of Sekuture. What is the fact? That in a unipolar world, the appetite to change had dissipated. As we see greater polarization between the West, the East, and the Middle, we're going to see once again an intensification of interference. First African country got independent, 1957. There is not a single Jewish person who will allow you to forget the Holocaust. And it's, in fact, there are crimes, not just in Israel, across the world against denial of the Holocaust. U.S. foreign policy, Israeli foreign policy, is very key. It's a central issue. Africans, for some reason, must forget something that happened 50 years ago, if you are Zimbabwe, 80 years ago. Listen, we must always remind our friends from Europe and elsewhere that slavery was a crime against humanity, as is colonialism and neocolonialism. That killing Sankara in 1984 because you are opposed to communism and plunging his country into chaos that you are now trying to solve as a problem of poor governance is a shared responsibility. So we will take responsibility for our nakedness. But for goodness sake, for goodness sake, 
a, a naked emperor cannot lecture us about how to be clothed. <laughs> and I'll tell you the contradictions. When Europeans first came here, if you come to the south of continent, uh, ladies did not wear long skirts. And they did not cover their top. Then they said, no, 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 that's indecent. So we covered everything, including the head. <laughs> and then the Europeans have decided to go nude now. Now the dress code in Europe is pre-colonial Africa. <laughs> And then when our kids try and dress up that way, we say it's an African. We are confused around ownership. So lastly, Chairperson, uh, the taboos. You see, Chairperson, we need to talk about global anti-black racism, the treatment of African migrant laborers in the Middle East, in the Arab world, and in the Asian world, and in Europe is a matter for the African Union to constantly pronounce itself on. And I'm glad, Chairperson, you issued a statement on George Floyd, but I'm waiting for the African Union resolution from last January on reparations. There was a formal policy of the United States government in 2015 for reparations by companies behind the Holocaust. There needs to be, the conversation on reparations is not to be settled by African political elites, right? Today, Zimbabwe is paying back white commercial farmers reparations. But when you talk about any reparations, it's like the black body is not worth repair. What we must do is endure, be resilient, go forward, don't look back, trudge on. But today with the scramble of Africa that PLO was talking about, they will interfere here whether we put in place the right policies or we put in place the good governance. Why? They need the lithium. And if your right policy is not consistent with their green energy transition that they control, they will take you out and they will cause instability. We cannot do it as single countries. We are not uniting because it's the, the good thing to do. We are not uniting because it's the principal thing to do. If we don't unite, we will perish. If each one of our small countries, as economically unviable as we are, rush in order to prove distinctiveness, I'll tell you what will happen. We will be so fragmented intellectually, politically. Our institutions will have no meaning. Let me end with uh, something more positive. I think Pan-Africanism flavor is alive today. You adults, you only listen when you have had a few glasses of wine to Afrobeat. And of course, you don't like this thing. They are always singing about body parts and so on and so forth. I want to suggest to you, one of the most revolutionary things that uh, the African Union, under the leadership of the, the chairperson here, has done, is to talk about arts, culture, and heritage, not as entertainment, not as add-on, but as part of imagining the future economy, is to talk about the digital, not as part of little things you do, but as part of building the economy. All that's left now is how do we defend African art, culture, and heritage, not only in Africa, but globally. How do we make sure it is the mainstream of AFCFTA, along with all the other big things we do? And how do we, in the digital economy, make sure we are not consumers of products that are produced elsewhere and not part of the production chain. Okay. If we do that, our Pan-Africanism is economic, our Pan-Africanism is cultural, our Pan-Africanism is intellectual, our Pan-Africanism is also spiritual. Just remember what Chinu Achebe said. We are not the children of Africa. We are the parents of Africa because the Africa that we want is yet to be born. And we are the ones that history has charged with the responsibility to give, back, to give birth to the Africa we want. So whatever we are frustrated with, with respect to the African Union, our responsibility is how do we make the normative frameworks and the institutions work, but how do we build the repository of expertise so that the African Union at any given time has access to the best brains, the best technical expertise in any field on the continent. The intervention in Iraq was couched in very benign terms. The intervention in Libya was couched in benign terms. I could give you 100 interventions where the justification, objectively speaking, was on the basis that there was evidence either of genocide or evidence. I'm sitting in Rwanda. 
The international community stood by as the genocide against the Tutsi happened. Yet in the same year, they were intervening in West Africa. The construct of benign and malign is controlled and related to the question of narrative and strategic self-interest. We've often not paid enough attention, and thank you, Chairperson of the African Union, for educating us on how the international fora of decision-making, the Security Council, and other fora, including at some stage, how we transact within the International Criminal uh, Court and other platform. That evidence, and that was my point, we don't control data, we don't control digital platforms, we therefore are not controlling narrative in both analog and digital forms. What can practically be done? We do need to speak to Europeans, not as victims, because the erasure of the contribution in European consciousness of Africans to modernity and civility has constructed a white supremacist view that sees the evolution of modernity as a singularly European contribution. And it is only now that our young researchers are beginning to excavate the contributions of black people, of Africans, towards inventions. Because until now, the province of economy was not the province of black people. In my country, in Zimbabwe, when land was taken, a British court gave a judgment that said, the question before them and who owned the land, they said, one thing is certain, it cannot be the native because the native has no sense of ownership. It was on that basis that land was taken. Number two, on the question of economics, even we pejoratively only talk about our people as informal law, informal economy, inform yet the informal economy is formal. That's how India developed through its cottage industry. That's how. We have a psychotic addiction to colonial definitions of what, and that's why Professor Ashraf is correct. It's not just a narrative about our contribution historically. It's a narrative about our contribution now. Our young people who developed Mpesa, which is now being used globally, who developed Ushaidi, which has been used by over 300,000 organizations, including the Japanese, the US military, and the NATO forces, are never sufficiently credited. Why? Because it is not in the current psyche of most Europeans possible that Africans are anything else except the object of charity that deserve our mercy and our pity. Why? Because they are by, governed by tyrants, right? Or Africans are incapable of ethics. And we've constantly said that Switzerland, which received their bachelor loot, which received the loot from the then Zaire, now DRC, has constantly been ranked in anti-corruption indices as the cleanest country in the world. PLO and I are lawyers. The receipt of stolen property is theft at law. How is it that you will have Nigeria and Kenya ranked so far, and yet the country that receives the money ranks so up? I, I think that if you're changing narrative, you also have to change behavior. Our African leaders and citizens constantly confirm the European caricature, mm. an object of pity. When we come into these spaces, we, uh, we can never transact resolution, uh, revolution in courtesy. I like to be civil, to be courteous, right? But each time I start pointing to atrocities committed by African governments, the Europeans and the Americans cheer me up. Each time I refer to the historical atrocities and continuing atrocities committed first by governments and by companies that are dumping cyanide into our underground water and nuclear waste, right? You know what it is said? This is retrogressive. It's uh, undermining investment. It's again, listen, we cannot win the narrative battle by arguing in pockets. They are happy us talking about our localized indigenized oppression. They are never happy us talking about the question of distribution and redistribution of the global economy of global power. And what Nkrumah and others realized in 1963 at the founding conference, if pa Africa is not represented, if Africa does not own its narrative, but you can't own your narrative if your leadership is totally disconnected from its people. Mm -hmm. You can't own your narrative 
if your intellectuals are totally disconnected, we have underinvested in rural areas and slums where the majority of our people are. In fact, we treat them as security threats and they are over policed. Number two, we have underinvested in our academic and research institution. We'd rather bring McKinsey and bring Deloitte in touch. They will help us do AU reform. Why? Because there are no African consultancies that we know. Even if they exist, we have no relationship with them to help us with AU reforms, with anything else. And I'm not, this is not a pronouncement on McKinsey or Deloitte. It's a pronouncement on ourselves. We have not, as a leadership, begun to recognize that the native is capable of knowledge. The native is capable of economy. The native is capable of invention. You can't change the narrative if the starting premise is we're trying to be like Europe and to catch up. We can't change the narrative when we're constantly trying to learn from others without understanding, and I'll end with that, what William Tunga said, the former Chief Justice of Kenya. He says, let's not engage in this romanticist view that there can only be one way to learn. We first must indigenize knowledge, that's what I said, learn from our culture and traditions. Number two, we must diversify who we learn from. We can only, not only learn from the West, we need to learn from everybody who has something to teach. Number three, we must domesticate what we learn. If we're going to learn anything, let's domesticate. I think the, uh, the, the chairperson and the minister said it's consciousness. Narrative is first and foremost by realizing self-worth, self-belief, and looking inward so that when you look outward, it is to supplement not a vacuous state of nothingness and inferiority, but it is to supplement a very stable, solid foundation where your culture, where your values, where your value for people is important. Wow. <laughs> a people that cannot feed themselves, that depend on foreigners to feed them, will become slaves, either willingly or by force, until this continent assures its stomach infrastructure by its ability to feed itself, until this continent assured, assures its mental infrastructure by the ability to think for itself and ideate then this continent will be thought for by others, fed by others. There is no liber liberty without these liberated intellectual zones and the ability to feed yourself. So interference happens because of our own inferiority and because of the supremacist views of others. Anyway, thank you for watching this video. Kindly consider hitting that subscribe button and give us your thoughts on the comment section below.